Hi folks, Michael here and Rupert here. Welcome to the Prehistory Guide's weekly roundup where we tell you a little bit about some of the items that have come up in the news. Yes, this week we're looking at items from ancient Babylon, Herefordshire in England and Henan province in China. So, first up, we are looking at an amazing discovery from modern day Iraq. And it's another of the increasing number of insights from modern techniques changing our understanding of items that have been in museum collections for ages. Now, this was found in Iraq way back in 1894. And it's a small clay tablet from Babylon evocatively catalogued as SI-427, and it reveals the earliest known use of Pythagorean principles. In fact, about a thousand years before Pythagoras was even born. Uh, now, this has all come to light not because of an archaeologist, but a mathematician. The lead researcher is Dr Daniel Mansfield from University of New South Wales School of Mathematics and Statistics. He first read about the tablet when he was reading the original excavation report, which said that it had gone to the Imperial Museum of Constantinople, which obviously doesn't exist anymore. So uh, he went on a real detective mission to track it down, and he finally got his hands on it in 2018. His remarkable findings have just been published. So SI-427 dates from between 1900 and 1600 BC, it's essentially a cadastral document, if you like, a surveyor's plan defining land boundaries. Now, the tablet talks about structures on the marshy piece of land, including a tower, but crucially, it's engraved with Pythagorean geometry showing how this piece of land was divided up after some of it was sold. Now, I'm not going to go into the actual mathematics or trigonometry on the tablet. Very wise move, that, Mr Soskin. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Other than to say, if you remember Pythagoras's theorem from school, you know, kind the of. square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides, it's that. Sets of triangles used to precisely calculate land division 3,700 years ago. <laughs> awesome. It is awesome. What's more, I heartily recommend uh, folk out there seek out uh, Dan Mansfield. Um, that's, that's the actual mathematician that did this work. Uh, Dan Mansfield has his own YouTube channel and there's a great video. It's half hour long in which he thoroughly and completely deciphers the tablet in front of our eyes. Completely mind-boggling. Yeah, What's astonishing sure. to me is the amount of detail that's crammed into this this little little tablet. Yeah. Um, suggests to me that cuneiform as a form of writing is extremely efficient. Uh, I find it quite mind-boggling. If you, you mm. have a look at uh, the collection of Babylonian tablets in the British Museum, for example, I, these extraordinary things that... The density, oh, you know, that you think this is all uh, impressed, you know, with reed yeah. stylus, impressed into clay. And just the density of characters within those uh, tablets and the wealth of information that's actually within them. I, I, yeah. uh, I wish I could read if Babylonian. Well, th three elements of it, really, you know, considering how it's being impressed into, into the clay. You've got this, uh, the, the detail of the transaction, because pretty much we're looking at a surveyor's report of a field, which is very interesting to me because I'm just about to uh, employ a surveyor because we're moving house pretty soon. Well, I'll tell you what, the thoroughness with, this, with, with which this guy has gone about his task, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have this fella <laughs> from Sipav, you know, from... Uh, 3,700 years ago. It's the amount of information, you know, the detail about the field, the bits of the marshy area and the tower and, uh, and stuff like that. But also the Pythagorean element of it, that's not just about marking stuff off. That is about ensuring the absolute accuracy. And we're talking here to about, you know, at least two decimal points uh, of whatever measuring unit they're using, and this guy is not working in decimal. <laughs> no, they it, were base 60, weren't they? It was base 60, sexagesimal. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, 
basically he's a genius <laughs> and he's just a surveyor. Yeah, it, it is. It's bonkers stuff. Uh, and when you think that this level of complexity 3,700 years ago, how <laughs> long must that, uh, that just that social practice, how much, uh, how long mu must all that have been already in place? Yeah, for us to be talking about uh, you know things being divided up with that level of accuracy, it's you know the the whole thing about land ownership, yeah. apart from anything else, I find the whole thing fascinating. It's well, the thing is, whoever uh, whoever in, uh, inscribed this tablet, he was not alone. He would have had competitors. He would have had you know other firms of uh, surveyors d doing this. They would have been trained in this stuff. Yeah. Uh, just absolutely astonishing. We could go on forever. I think I'd better move on to the next topic <laughs> now, yes. uh, which actually brings us a little bit closer to home. Uh, well, closer to my home. <laughs> actually, the thing is it's about only about two, uh, two hours' drive down the road. Um, yeah, something with which I'm much more familiar. Now, you may remember I made a short film a little while back about Arthur Stone in Herefordshire. That's the tomb with the massive capstone that inspired C.S. Lewis's stone table in The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe. Um, no plot spoilers here about uh, what happened to <laughs> Aslan. No, no, moving swiftly along. Well, the thing is, recent excavations have shed a little more light on this imposing 3,700-year-old passage tomb. Professor Julian Thomas from Manchester University and Professor Keith Ray from Cardiff University have excavated in the field adjacent to the site and revealed that the structure originally extended quite some way to the south. Originally, the term had been a long turf mound. I mean, think Long Barrow, think Bellis Knapp, for example, not too far off. Um, and that was retained by a surrounding palisade of upright posts. In a later stage, an avenue of larger posts was added, leading towards the mound from the Golden Valley below. The Golden Valley below, that's not me being whimsical, by the way. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, really it really is, is what called, it's called, called yes. it the Golden Valley, yeah, down there. The original mound surrounding the stones we see today, the remains of the internal uh, chambers, is visible in crop markings when viewed from the air and would have stretched back to the north, into the, into the field to the north. But the interesting thing here is that the first structure aligned with the nearby hilltop of Dorston Hill. However, the later stage, with the avenue of larger posts combined with the two stone chambers inside the mount to align with a gap between the hills to the southeast on the far horizon. Julian Thomas explained that the different orientations of the two phases of construction are significant because their excavations on Dorston Hill in 2011 and 2019 revealed three long mounds, similar in construction to that now known to represent the first stage of Arthur Stone. Dorston Hill, this excavation that uh, Julian Thomas did in 2011 to 2019, uh, is about a mile away, just for just for clarity's uh, sake. Um, you know, just in the sort of shadow of Dorston Hill. I didn't actually realise it was quite that far, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can pretty much see it from uh, from Arthur's Stone, almost uh, kind of. Anyway, uh, Julian Thomas went on to say that each of the three turf mounds, those are the mounds over at Dorston Hill, had been built on the footprint of a previous large timber building, and I think this is a timber building that had been inhabited, but that had been deliberately burnt down. So what you've got in effect, and this is uh, Julian Thomas's own phrase, you've got the houses of the living became the houses of the dead, with these tombs essentially built exactly on top of where the original um, uh, building, timber building, had been. So the upshot of all this is that Arthur's Stone has now been identified, not just as a singular monument standing all alone in the landscape, but it's that, uh, that it's been closely connected with these nearby Halls of the Dead, which was all over the news back in 2013, I believe. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Burning down, more burning down. <coughs> More burning down. It's an interesting one, the burning down, isn't it? Um, yeah. I'm always in two minds about it because on the one hand you could have 
I mean, maybe it's a situation where, as Julian uh, said, that uh, you have uh, houses of the living becoming the houses of the dead. I suppose, you know, if you actually made somebody's house into their tomb, yeah. you know, maybe there's, yeah. some, there's some sense in that. Why I not? also uh, I have this thing, though, about the burning down that... Uh, you know that where things you know charcoal has been found and they've said that these were deliberately burnt down and i think well you know often charcoal you know you burn timber posts so they uh, don't rot when you put them in the ground yeah. and uh, uh, there's also the thing of they would have been using pig fat probably for lighting yeah. uh, all their all their uh, lamps and what have you would have been burning very flammable stuff mm. in a house made of wood so yeah. I think it's quite likely that houses burnt down <laughs> fairly frequently. Let's face yeah. it, our, our fire brigades go uh, driving all over the place <laughs> all the time in houses that are now supposed to be fireproof and made of bricks. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. I'm very much in two minds about the deliberate burning uh, <laughs> interpretation. Anyway. Anyway, moving along. Wonderful stuff. OK, well, I'm taking us way over to China now, where a team of researchers from Zhengzhou University and Peking University have published their findings from a dig site in Hunan province, where they have discovered the earliest known coin factory, or mint, if you like. Mm -hmm. Prior to this discovery, the oldest coins had been found in Turkey and date to around 630 BC. This discovery is particularly interesting because the coins and moulds have been found at the known site of the ancient city of Guanzhang, which was founded around 800 BC. Now, coins alone are extremely difficult to date, but because they found coins and moulds in the same site... Because <laughs> I don't think they put the dates on them, did they? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But because they found coins and moulds in the same site, the ash from around the moulds has enabled them to carbon date them very accurately. And the results have shown that the coins were being made here between as early as 640 BC and as recently as 550 BC. Now, that doesn't take the date for coins back particularly far, but the point is that this is a factory and the researchers believe the facility was in use as early as 770 BC to make tools, weapons and other objects. So it's not certain exactly when it became an actual mint. Now, obviously, the real reason that people began using currency is still completely unknown. And there's no consensus amongst researchers and historians. Some believe it was the basic evolution of trade. Others believe it stems from ruling powers, finding easier ways to collect taxes. We will never know. Or will we? Or will we? Do you know, if, uh, if more of the kind of thing revealed in the tablet from uh, Mesopotamia comes to light... Who knows what kind of insights might become available it is true. to us. It is true. We, we don't know, do we? Yeah. There's just It's amazing what is being unravelled these days. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure people... I, I'll, uh, obviously, there aren't uh, pictures on the podcast version of, of, of this. So um, the, the coins that were being minted in China around about then, they, they don't, they're not exactly... The, coins, Jim, but not as we know them. Is that a fair way of putting it? <laughs> yeah, it is a fair way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. They're sort of uh, lozenge-y sort of shape. It seemed to be a function of the way they're made rather than, uh, yeah, between, between two uh, uh, plaster Yes, moulds, it is yeah. interesting. I, I, th I mean, let's face it, the only reason we've come to use circular coins is because uh, they're the easiest thing to do in large quantities with that, mm. that won't make mm. holes in your pockets. Yeah, these would make holes in your pockets by the looks of them. It's definitely make <laughs> holes in your pockets. <laughs> anyway, that's it for now, though. Um, links to our Patreon page down below and also to our Buy Me A Coffee page where any one-off donations are going towards the production of a sequel to our 2008 film, Standing The Stones. Either way, your support is most welcome. Thank you so much for listening and if you're on YouTube for watching... See you all soon. Bye for now. Bye.